Great. Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take the top stories in crypto and break them down into bite-sized pieces. So today, just the thumbnail suggests, I'm going to give a, a little analogy about uh, Bitcoin and nuclear. Nuclear power, nuclear warheads, and all that, uh, the positives and the negatives. And uh, it's become abundantly clear that, uh, as I said in the thumbnail, the sword can cut both ways. So we're going to take a look at uh, what's going on in the in the news. Uh, Swift ban, all crypto outcome, the FBI and national security. We're also going to take a look at a little story about uh, how an executive from Credit Suisse is coming over to Coinbase. And I think there's going to be more of that. And finally, we'll take a look at the bright side of politics, because let's be honest, hasn't been too great so far. And then at the very end, we'll do a little Q&A. So hold your questions until the end. But first, let's take a look at what's going on in the market. And also, if you're here for uh, live, hey, thanks. It's a Sunday. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Uh, if you're watching the replay, there should be some timestamps uh, underneath. I think I forgot them yesterday. Sorry about that. But there should be some today. And uh, just know the news takes about 15 or 20 minutes. And then at the very end, the Q&A takes about, it's five minutes. And there's five questions in five minutes, and it should be that. So let's just take a look very quickly about the market because it doesn't really matter. The market is sideways. I'm actually surprised it held up this far this well. We'll see how it goes by tomorrow when the traditional markets open up. But right now, uh, $1.8 uh, trillion. You know, it's uh, not too bad. It's not $3 trillion, but it is what it is. And uh, Bitcoin is down just a little bit. Everything's, it, except for Terra, everybody's just kind of, everything's mostly moving sideways. I mean, 2.8% loss for Polygon, not a big deal. 4% for uh, Nier, but that's what's, that's what's happening. So let's just talk about what is on everybody's minds, which is Ukraine. Uh, I think there's a, there's the issue I think some people are, are getting into is uh, trying to deal with the things outside their sphere. Remember, try to deal and understand uh, of what you can control, what you can't. So on, on some level, you actually want to take a look at uh, the good news too and see if uh, other people are doing great things. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I will tip my hat right now to Elon Musk for what he did right here. If you don't know, this was from uh, Mikhailo Fedorov, and I think he's the vice, uh, vice prime minister of Ukraine. And he says, looks, man, he's like, before you go to Mars, could you help us out, Elon, uh, for whatever you can do, especially with uh, Starlink? And Elon Musk said, yep, Starlink service is now active in Ukraine, more terminals in route. Why is that important? Well, it's important because as time goes on, you're going to see more loss of infrastructure because of the war. And it is vital, I think, that we get some kind of information that comes out. Uh, from that place, because if we just go to zero and we have no idea what's going on, then we have to rely on the media. And do you really want to rely on the media for exactly what's going on in a war-torn area? Not so much. So I think with Starlink, as they get that over there and the terminals come on, then uh, we can keep the flow of information that comes through. Also, as far as good news, this just can't just hit the wire about uh, 10 minutes ago, actually 45 minutes ago. And it looks like uh, the president of Ukraine the prime minister of Ukraine and Putin are, have agreed to meet at the Belarus border to discuss some things. So that is actually very positive. Also, I, I found this very positive. Uh, Ukraine army retakes uh, Kharkiv, you know, expelling Russian troops. So things are looking okay. And then also, as far as some good news, and this is a little bit selfish on my part, I must admit. Uh, this is the, we talked about this yesterday. This is the official Twitter account for uh, Ukraine. You should follow them. This is where all the information that I get from Ukraine comes from, uh, what's going on. I mean, because the news can tell you so much, but come on. And uh, they said, and they pinned this. Like they had different avenues of like, if you want to help us out, donate uh, to this and this, here's the banks, here's the routings, here's everything else. But they did pin just the crypto because I believe that they're getting a lot more uh, as far as donations in, in Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT or and, and the things they're taking. And also I saw a tweet where they're actually offering multi-chain. So uh, I linked this specific link in the description if you want to give to Ukraine, it's up to you. And uh, this is what I was talking about. You know, you, somebody said a very smart thing. Uh, they said, you can't help anybody if you're broke. And uh, if you were, you know, like, you know, James over the best answers were trading on this day, pretty good day. And now you're able to uh, 
uh, giveaway fund. So for me, I'll be donating uh, all the proceeds from this last probably month uh, from my coin from uh, uh, YouTube uh, for this because it's not just what Ukraine needs now. Like I said yesterday, uh, it's what they're going to need in the future as far as the refugees and the, and the displacement and things like that. So let me just think about that. Uh, but let's go into the show, which is it's it's tough to put together. So this thumbnail that uh, I have, it's because when I was thinking about things, it really has come to light just how powerful Bitcoin, crypto, and digital assets really are. I mean, this is at the heart of some things, a lot of things. And when I say the sword cuts both ways, it's the positives and the negatives. So I'm going to take you down a little bit of history trip. So look, the first nuclear explosion was on July 16th, 1945 in uh, New Mexico. July 16th, 1945, so long ago, right? And then just less than a month later, you had a bombing of Hiroshima. Pretty awful. Destructive force. No one can, can deny that. Very awful. On the flip side of that, within 10 years, there was a nuclear power plant up. And that created a ton of usable energy for a large population. And actually, the first one was in uh, Obninsk in the Soviet Union, June 27th, 1954. So what does this all come down to? It all comes down to a couple of things that's going on right now, globally, crypto, digital assets, where these things all go. And I think right now, I mean, you, if you thought that the SEC coming down on the ripple was a big thing, I think this is the bigger issue right now about what crypto can be. And I think it's going to come out on top. I'm going to tell you why. So first up, there's this whole thing about SWIFT. I need you to understand what SWIFT actually is. I know some of you know what it is. A lot of you know what it is, which is rare, I'll be honest with you, because in, in the normal society, no one, everybody's like, SWIFT, I don't know what it is. I go and I transfer money and uh, go someplace and that's it. I go to my bank, I go to Wells Fargo, they do their thing and that's it. Inflation, I don't know how that works. Fed Reserve, what is that? It's federal? No, it's not? I have no idea. So let's just break it down for anybody who may not know. So SWIFT, or the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. I love how they said this. Think of them as the Gmail of global banking. All it is is a, is a messaging service. That's all it really does. It just says, hey, you got some money here, you wanna transfer over there, that's the message, hopefully it makes it, right? It doesn't always, I think it's like a one or 2% uh, latency, it doesn't actually go through, but that's Swift, it's been around since 1977. Bankers use SWIFT to confirm orders, payments and trades, among other things. European countries use it to pay Russian companies for oil and gas. Sure. And uh, cross-country money transfers to pay bills or send money. And that's why XRP was supposed to be the big thing because it was going to eliminate those types of things and all the different uh, transaction fees. So here's what's going on. The global community, well, NATO and some other different uh, organizations and countries, they want to block Russia using SWIFT. But here's the holdup. Blocking SWIFT in Russia could actually hurt some European countries, particularly Germany and Italy. Without SWIFT, it would be harder for these countries to buy much needed Russian oil and gas. And others argue that cutting Russia out of SWIFT will just thrust into the arms of alternative messaging services or crypto. So here's the thing. First of all, all this oil and energy talk, you have to understand that uh, the two biggest producers, this is from 2020, barrels per day, US, Russia, those are the top two. And underneath that, you got Saudi Arabia, Canada, Iraq, China, so on and so forth, right? Which, if you're going to cut out Russia, that's a, a large producer of energy barrels and things like that. So what's going on? Well, this is what's going on. So right now, as of 12 hours ago, U.S. and the EU agreed to cut Russian bank out of the SWIFT financial system as part of the transactions. I didn't think they were going to do it, but apparently they are. So U.S., and European officials make clear that they are still working out the mechanics of how to implement the latest measures, but intend to spare Russia's oil and natural gas. So they're going to try to do this, but they're like, well, maybe not oil and natural gas. It'll come back to crypto in a second. Hold on. If fully carried out as planned, the measures will severely damage the Russian economy and constrain its ability to import and export goods. Here's the thing. They want to try to also restrict the central bank restrictions or put those in place and target access to more than $600 billion in reserves that the Kremlin has at its disposal. 
and are meant to block Russia's ability to support the ruble as it plunges in value amid tightening Western sanctions. Here's the thing. We're going to talk about this in a second. Analyst warns of regulatory risk if Russia is able to use crypto to evade sanctions. Remember they just said 600 billion? That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's just in the reserves. The entire market cap of crypto is 1.8 trillion and slipping, I might add. So even if Russia wanted to avoid, they could avoid some if they really are wallet number three and, and accumulating massive amounts of Bitcoin. But for them to avoid everything, I don't think that's how it's going to work, even though they did fast track uh, what was happening with crypto. So here's the thing and here's the problem. And here's where it comes down to sword cutting both ways and nuclear. Crypto faces regulatory risks if used by Russia to evade sanctions. We see how great Bitcoin can be. Take a look at El Salvador. Take a look at what could potentially happen in Venezuela and Turkey and all around the world. And also for remittance and uh, lightning, Jack Mahler's and everything else. And also take a look at uh, how it could help hold up as far as a store of value versus gold. It's pretty great. On the same side, people are worried that just like nuclear power, it can destroy things or it can build up and actually have a great power source. It can destroy things. And Putin is going to use that to avoid all these transactions. I don't think that's how it's going to work. And I think once we prove that, then all of a sudden, I believe crypto, digital assets, will be on the fast track for regulation. But here's what's going on. We believe Washington is worried that Russia will use crypto to evade sanctions. Cowan, Washington Research Group analyst, Jarrett Cyberg said Friday. But he makes a point, and it's a good point. If Russia is able to use crypto this way, then we believe political support in the U.S. for crypto will fall and regulatory risk will rise. So before you just poo-poo on that and just say there's no way that can potentially happen, couldn't it? Couldn't he go around it? Couldn't he use these for sanctions? I've been talking about this for quite some time, actually. I think there's an issue there, and we're going to talk about it right now, but in all honesty, there is a way around those things with crypto digital assets, but there's a way to combat that just like with nuclear power and nuclear warheads. So to finish this up, Cyborg, Cyborg, uh, believes that since most global trade is still dollar denominated, that's the great thing of being the US uh, or being the world reserve currency, uh, it could be challenging for Russia, Russia to use crypto to evade SWIFT. Just ask uh, Canada and what happened over there. Paying in Bitcoin requires a conversion to dollars, which provides a way to track activity. This also works in favor of crypto. It also works in favor if you're trying to track illicit activity, drug users, smugglers, money launderers, and the like. That's just my that's just my opinion. Pretty sure it works out like that. The government could track evasions using blockchain. This could be the crisis. That, this, this is the crux of the whole articles I was leading up to this. This could be the crisis that determines how the government treats its use for payments as a store of value crypto and digital assets. Pressure would be on the trading platforms and wallets. This would not just, I think more exchanges. This would not just be in the US. We expect it also apply in the UK, EU, and in the Western allies in Asia. And it makes a ton of sense. And it comes down to like, this just happened a week ago. FBI sets up cryptocurrency task force. They were actually able to claw back uh, that uh, hack. I forgot what it was. Uh, correct me in the comment section. Uh, but they were able to look at on-chain data analysis and figure out where the hacks were. And this is, I believe, why they do these types of things, because you can track wallets like crazy. Also, remember that uh, wormhole hack? Uh, people were able to track that down just by on-chain analysis. So it's pretty easy to do if you're trying to avoid sanctions. And also, if you want to do illicit activity, where would you want to do that? Would you want to do that in Bank Swiss? Or would you want to do that on the blockchain? We'll get to that in a second. And then I think this also is why this just happened, uh, what was this, a month ago? Biden labels crypto a national security threat. I think they knew things were coming out of the pipe. I think they knew where things were going. And I think they were trying to head it off because it's just a big chess game. Anyhow, that's what we have for that piece. I know it was a little bit lengthy, but uh, if you kind of look at it in the right way, Bitcoin and crypto, I never kind of saw it this way, but it's it can do massive good. I mean, we knew that, but there's a flip side of that. But even though there's a flip side, like we see with, with nuclear power and warheads and things like that, there's a way around those when used responsibly. Anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments section. Speaking of Credit Suisse, let's talk about this article. So 
an executive leaves Goldman Sachs for Coinbase. That's great. Time to embrace crypto, create economic freedom. This is very fast, don't worry. Uh, Roger Bartlett was a managing director and global co-head of operations for global markets. Before that, he was the global head of operations for equities for almost five years. Prior to joining Goldman Sachs, he was vice president at Credit Suisse for six. And he states, after 16 years at Goldman Sachs, it's time to embrace the crypto economy. I'm delighted to announce that. Next week, I'll be joining Coinbase to run global financial operations. I got to tell you, I like this guy. You know why? because he was a part of Credit Suisse. And those are the guys that know how to do some dirty things. Not that they all, they're all dirty, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that uh, this was uh, just <laughs> six days ago. Credit Suisse data leak reveals decades of shady clients and activity. Uh, leaked data shows that until recently, Swiss Bank, Credit Suisse held accounts valued at more than 100 billion for sanctioned, sanctioned, sanctioned individuals and heads of state reportedly accused of money laundering. The New York Times reported on Sunday that the data leak included more than 18,000 bank accounts. The data goes back to accounts that were open from the 40s until 2010s, but not current operations. So not current. Yeah, sure. And I don't even know what to say about that one. That is, uh, <laughs> if you're looking to do things, uh, look to the banks because uh, they have the ways around it because they've been doing it for years. Anyhow, that was just a little spot piece. Let's just go on to uh, a little bit of uh, some positivity, shall we? Uh, the bright side of politics. Well, at least for the U.S. and what's going on. So this was a Teddy Cruz. Uh, Ted Cruz was, uh, he was on stage. It's a, a conference, Republican conference or something like that. And he said he's bullish on Bitcoin because it's decentralized and uncontrollable. Be careful what you wish for right? He added that China recently banned Bitcoin because they can't control it, which is the exact same reason Elizabeth Warren hates Bitcoin. <laughs> so look, there is some positivity here. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of context that, uh, you know, there are some politicians that kind of understand what's going on with crypto and Bitcoin digital assets. But of course, they will yield that in the way that they can to discredit the other part because they're just politicians and they're all dirty in my opinion. But that's what's going on. So look, um, I just wanted to show, just uh, throw out some quick information. And uh, that is it for today's news. So if you want to take off, it's okay. It's Sunday. I'm sure you got a lot. To spend time with the family, church, all that great stuff. Great. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Give it a thumbs down if you didn't, but tell me why so maybe I can fix it next time. And then consider subscribing. I mean, if you're here already, you might as well subscribe. And let's go into the little Q&A, shall we? see what's going on. Hopefully I can answer some questions. So if that's it, I'll see you. Let's start. Well, thanks. Thanks, Bridge Bridge. I appreciate it. Let me hide this so I can get this. Okay. There's always a delay. Sorry. There's like a 30 second delay be between now and when I can actually get the questions. So sorry. No nuclear power in current designs. That's true. Greetings from Ecuador. Hey, Rob. Uh, hey, Rob, thanks. Question number one. Hey, Rob, thanks for your time, especially on a Sunday. Yeah, I probably should have skipped today, especially on a Sunday. Wondering what you think about the decline in Uniswap price, DeFi in general. I think the natural progression will be from centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges or DEXs. I don't see centralized exchanges staying afloat forever. But you have to understand, if you're gonna do regulations, you need a centralized exchange because that's the point of failure where you can shut things down. You saw it in Canada. And even Jesse, I almost said Jesse Owens, Jesse Powell, the CEO of Kraken said, hey, if you don't want to have government interference, get yourself a cold storage wallet and use that because if they come to me, I will shut you down. And he said that and I have to, I have to commend him, actually. Uh, did I miss the bad news? No, it does. I mean, just there is bad news and good news all around. And again, it's all about like every morning I say the same thing on Twitter. And I say, uh, here's to a great day. You know, here's to or, you know, I feel a great day's come on or whatever I say. It's always about the great day. And today I, I had to make it crystal clear. I was like, here's to a great day, even though half the world's on fire. Try to control what you can control within your circle and be content with that. That's what it is. Because if not, you just burn up. All right. <laughs> B 
Bridget says, I'm in Canada. I'm not exactly what the government has done, wants to do regarding. The only thing I heard is they asked one exchange for customers info and were basically told to stuff it. Yeah, pretty much. Well, them and then the um, the Ontario, I would say that wrong, uh, legislative court or something like that, they reached out uh, to the mounted police and said, hey, there are these American exchanges and they are telling people to use these uh, uh, wallets. We don't want them to do that. And they're like, what the hell you want us? We can't do anything. But uh, yeah, I, I heard that they arrested some people that uh, were, I mean, but honestly, there were pretty some pretty bad people over there. So I don't know if it's one exchange or a couple exchanges, but it is what it is. And it, is, it just goes to show you where things could go. So they can go to exchange while exchange and said, hey, shut it down. I mean, even one of our exchange CEOs said, I'd probably do it or I would do it. So the great question, question number three, how much does it cost to be a gala node operator? I think right now it's around $90,000. Correct me in the comment section, but that's how much uh, someone said that they paid for a gala uh, to become a gala node operator. Now things have changed because prices have decreased, but eh, roughly maybe 70 on a good day. I don't know. Great. I'd love to go to Iceland. I'll be in London on May. Ah, question number three. What do you think uh, the UE, this is, I think it's the EU, uh, European Union, trying to pass a bill to ban crypto. And I think it, was the, it wasn't the EU, it was uh, the European Union Parliament, which is the legislative body of the European Union. And uh, they came out and there was a, a leaked document that said that they wanted to uh, get rid of or ban proof of work cryptos because of, well, they said it was for the ESG issues, which is uh, the um, environmental issues. But I think also it was, there was a problem with energy because right now with what's going on in Ukraine and and uh, that's going to boost up the uh, price of uh, oil. So if you're trying to get you know, and energy and gas and things like that, it's going to be a little bit more pricey. So maybe you don't want a bunch of people running a bunch of Bitcoin nodes. So uh, I think it was the, the bill was supposed to come through and for a vote on February 28th, I think, 28th, 27th. And they, de they delayed it because there was all this talk about they were trying to, the wording looked like they were trying to ban the proof of works. So that's all, that's all I know. I think it's what I, all I, anybody knows right now. Ah, let's see. This is a loaded question. Question number four, what do you think the implications are for Ukraine accepting digital assets? Well, if you look at the transaction volume, you know, let's try something. I don't know if I can, let me see. Do, 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 do. Now nah, it'll take too long. But what it is, is you can, nah, this won't take that long. Let me Let me show you something. Let's see. If you go to blockchain.com, you just you should just type in the actual address, right? Uh, let's see. Holy smokes. You can see how much is in there. Here's the address. There's this many transactions. I don't know if you can see that that well. You can see total sent, the final balance. And I believe somewhere you can see the actual uh, price for each transaction. And I can just tell you like somebody sent like a boatload of, uh, of Bitcoin. And uh, when they did that, it was like 18, I think it was like over a million dollars of the Bitcoin. And it was like 18 cents or something like that. So how do I see it? Uh, what I see right now, whoops. What I see right now is they have the things that they need all for the most part. I'm not on the ground, obviously, so feel free to correct me. But I think the bigger need is going to come later on for the refugees because those refugees, everybody's trying to get out, not everybody, but there's a mass amount of people trying to get out of Ukraine, unless you're a male between the age of 18 and 60, I believe. That means that when you go out there, you are displaced. Well, how do you have shelter? and food and water. And maybe it's just you, or maybe it's you and your kids, or maybe it's you and your grandparents. 
how do you support all those hundreds of thousands of people out there? The refugee issue is going to come to a head and that's where you're gonna need a lot of manpower, uh, a lot of supplies and a lot of money. So if you're, if you're looking to donate, that'd be probably be the, the thing that I would go to. All right. There are so many bots here. Yeah, maybe. Uh, there's one more. Where did it go? Oh, Lord. I didn't want to get into that. Ah. So, last question. I got to get out of here. I'm late. What what you invest in now if you had a lot of dry powder? I don't have a lot of dry powder, but I can tell you what I invest into every single day. Um, I just dollar cost average. <laughs> I don't know if you've been on the show, but that's pretty much it. And um, if if we would have seen, I thought it was going to go down further, but it didn't. But I just let my daily buys execute on Voyager. There's no emotion to it, it just buys. So it buys Bitcoin, Ethereum, Chainlink, Cardano, Luna. I didn't buy any Solana. Uh, there's something else. There's actually two more. Gala, that was one of them. And there's something else. And it always just, it just executes. I just buy it every single day. So I don't know if it's going to go up or it's going to go down, but I think, I think in like five years, three, four, five years, I'll probably do pretty well. I mean, that's just financial opinion, not financial advice. Don't follow me. But uh, it worked out pretty well in 2017 when I was buying Bitcoin at, well, actually 2018. when Because 2017, I was buying Bitcoin at like 12,000. I was okay for a while. But then I, then I bought Bitcoin at like 5,000, 7,000, 8,000. That wasn't too bad. Then I was buying Ethereum around 500, 400, 6, that's still pretty good. And then, of course, I was buying Cardano with 7 cents and 8 cents. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, over time, it kind of works itself out, I mean, but not all the time. Uh, take a look at uh, salt, like I call it, say it a dash of salt. If you invested in a salt when it was at all-time high, it was like 15 bucks. Now it's like nine cents. If you invested into dash at an all-time high, it was quite a bit, and it hasn't reached its all-time high or near that in some time. So you could have dollar cost average, but you'd be underwater again, no matter how long. All right, so that's it. So look, uh, I got to get going. So if you liked today's video, Give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Just tell me why in the comment section. Say, eh, this sucked because whatever else. Great, I'll fix it. And uh, that's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one. Adios.